Imagine war coming to your doorstep. Imagine your home being destroyed by an earthquake or a hurricane. Everything changes. You can no longer look after yourself or your family. Not here, not anymore. It's time to move. Imagine what you lose, what you leave behind. Relatives, friends, prized possessions, your wedding photo, your child's favorite toy, your home, your way of life, a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging. Imagine the struggles that you face on your journey. Imagine the choices that you have to make to stay, to go, to stop, to continue, to leave someone behind, perhaps. Imagine finding sanctuary and assistance, that sense of relief and waiting and uncertainty. You don't really want to be here. You're not even sure where here is. But at least it feels safer for now. Imagine receiving food. At least you think it's food. It's not stuff that you eat normally. It's not stuff that you know how to prepare. You've heard there's other food, stuff that's more palatable, nearby the camp, not too far away. But you don't have any money left. You spent all of your precious resources getting this far. You could, of course, sell the food that you've been given to buy something you'd rather eat. But you don't really speak the language. You don't know the local customs, the markets, the prices. Imagine being asked your opinion by people who arrive in white 4 by 4s with different colored logos on the side, wearing different colored vests. At first, this feels good. Someone wants to hear my opinion, your opinion, where you come from, what you need, what your hope and fears are, who you are. But after a while, it gets a little bit irritating. Different people come asking similar questions, and not much seems to change. Now, were you to find yourself in a situation like this, the chances are you would encounter one of tens of thousands of people who, like me, work for a humanitarian aid agency. People who, again, like me, got into this line of work because we wanted to alleviate the suffering caused by war and disaster. We wanted to make a difference. People who care. And yet, as the examples I've tried to give you illustrate, often there's a disconnect between the aid worker and the people that we try to assist. There's a breakdown in communication. Somewhere along the line, the human has dropped out of humanitarian. And this is a problem. It's a problem not only because there's a sort of fundamental contradiction between the human impulse to help and the frustration of being helped in the wrong way or having your opinions ignored. It's a problem because studies show that the longer people are passive recipients of aid, the more that initial feeling of somebody cares for me, I'm no longer alone, gives way to a sense of frustration, helplessness, and despair. Studies also show that one of the key things that helps people move out of poverty and take control of their lives is a sense of self-belief, belief in their own self-efficacy. So we can see that there's a fundamental disconnect here. Something isn't quite working. I think it's really important when talking about this problem to recognize that this isn't about the failing of an individual aid worker or the failing of individual aid agencies. It's altogether too systemic and systematic this is a common problem. There's something about how aid is delivered that leads to this. And why is that then? What is it about aid that leads to this problem or how we do aid that leads to this problem? So I want to offer four observations that I've made in, in the last 25 years working in, in aid agencies as to why I think this problem arises and why it persists. And then we'll talk about what I think we can do about it. So the first of these problems is scale. Now, if you reflect on the sheer number of people in need of assistance and you reflect upon what that means for organizations who try to respond, you can see that there's a real push towards standardization. It's a lot easier to help lots of people if, you take, if you're, you're delivering, as it were, programming in a box. It's much harder to think outside of that box. 
Similarly, if you think about how easy it is, or relatively easy it is, to listen to one person or a handful of people, hear their opinions and respond accordingly, and then you think about, well, what would that feel like in a refugee camp or with thousands of people on the move, you can see why scale pushes us to standardize. A related problem is one of urgency, right? Everything we do is under the pressure of time. Sometimes it's because there literally are lives at stake and people will die if things don't happen within a certain specified time period. But more generally, there's a, de there's a, there's a time pressure, there's a desire to help as many people as possible at the lowest possible cost. And that really puts pressure on your ability to respond. So again, urgency pushes us in the direction of standardization. In a sense, a related problem is one of habit, okay? We all have habits, we all have patterns of behavior. You all know what this feels like, you know how difficult it is to break out of patterns that you have established in your own lives. Think about the aid worker moving from crisis to crisis and bringing with them accumulated experience about what works or what has worked in other circumstances and bringing with them evidence of what's worked across a whole host of other places that they perhaps haven't necessarily worked in themselves. All of this is good stuff. This is really, really useful, but it can also serve as a set of blinkers. You can forget that each situation is unique, each person and individual. But by far, I think, the most important of the reasons for this, this disconnect, this problem, is a question of power. Our customers don't really get to shop around for alternative service providers very easily, right? It's not that kind of arrangement. We, as aid providers, are beholden to the people who provide money to us to deliver assistance. We are not beholden to our clients, to our customers, to our end users. And that changes and affects everything. And I think there's something we can do about that, and I think there's something you can do about that, but we'll come back to that uh, at the end of this talk. So, four problems and or four reasons for a problem. And I think it, this at least pushes us to think that any solution to this problem needs to be both scalable, it needs to work under emergency or urgent settings, it needs to break and challenge our habits and assumptions, but most of all, it needs to shape those power relations. So what can we do about this? How do we deal? I've got three uh, solutions that I'd like to propose. These are things that are already up and running they're being pushed forward by individuals, by individual aid agencies, and by communities of like-minded people across the world. The first of these, paradoxically you might say, as a way of restoring human dignity or humanity into a relationship, is cash. Cold, hard cash. Notes, coins, vouchers, an ATM card, it might be a transfer to someone's mobile phone. Whatever is appropriate to the context in question. Why give people stuff, blankets, tents, food, buckets, stuff that they end up selling more often than not in order to buy what they actually feel they need? Why not give people choice and a little bit of power in a world in which they've lost both? Now, when this was first floated some years ago, people's reaction was, or some people's reaction was, hang on a minute, you can't possibly give cash to an aid recipient. They'll squander it. They'll waste it on, on cigarettes or alcohol. And some people stay, still say this today. <coughs> Let's go back to our imagination exercise that we started with. There you are in your camp. You've got nothing. You're given some cash. Now, are you going to blow it on a short-term fix, or are you going to use it to meet the urgent needs of yourself and your family members? Studies show repeatedly that that is exactly what people do in multiple contexts, and it's been studied over and over again. People use cash wisely. And better than that, cash has a really positive effect. Cash as assistance has a really positive effect on the local economy. Now, this example comes from Lebanon, where uh, cash grants of $150 uh, dollars in value translated into $320 of economic activity in the local economy. So, why is that important? In Lebanon, one in four people, 25% of the population, are refugees. Imagine the strain that places on the country, 
on social relations, on the local economy, on local services. What's good for the local economy and the host population is good for the newcomer. Benefit in local economic action and interaction translates into renewed support for the important concepts of sanctuary, refuge and assistance. So cash is generally a very, very positive uh, and important solution. So I'm not saying that it's the only solution, nor am I saying it is necessarily appropriate in all contexts, right? We can imagine situations where there's no functioning market. We can imagine situations where it might put people at risk. But I think the question that needs to be on all of our lips is why not cash? The presumption needs to be cash first. Okay, so that's one solution and it's beginning to move. Now, that doesn't solve everything, right? Remember how frustrating it was to have your opinion not heard. So, the next, again, a paradoxical word perhaps for restoring humanity, data. But here I mean the right kind of data, in the right amount, at the right time, and used in the right way. So what do I mean by that? Okay, let's stop imagining you're fleeing war. Let's imagine now that you're in my shoes or those of my colleague. You're running a massive project, you're under huge time pressure, you've got donor deliverables that you have to meet, and the situation's changing all the time. Whose voice do you listen to? Who do you ask? There's thousands of people. Who do you ask? How do you ask? What if they tell you something that you can't respond to? So these are the kind of fears and um, hindrances that we face as aid workers. This is the challenge that faces us when it comes to listening to people's opinions. And people tend to, aid workers tend to react in one of two ways, right? There's the head in the sand approach, right? I'm just, I can't deal with this. There's too many voices. I'm just going to deliver what I said I was going to do, what it says in my documents, and I'll do some good. That's the head in the sand approach. It's not great. Um, the other approach is to go completely the other way and over-survey, ask loads of questions, generate loads of reports. If only we could just really understand the situation, then we could do the right thing. And that yields massive reports that sit on people's desks and gather dust. They're never read because they arrive too late or they're just too long and people don't have the time. So what's the answer? We need to be as nimble with our data as we are in, or as we strive to be with our assistants, right? We need to survey, we need to take a temperature check, but a very, very light one, very few questions asked quite often to get a sense of whether or not what we're doing is what people need and what they feel about it. We need to use that data to start a conversation. Go in and check our assumptions. See really what is going on. Are, are, people, are we hearing what people think they're telling us and can we, can we close that gap? And then we actually need to use that information. We need to make changes. We need to course correct. And we need to see if that affects uh, people's, people's sense of whether or not we're on, on track or not. And this isn't, this isn't impossible, right? This, this path has been charted for us in the customer satisfaction industry and in public services the world over. There's a lot that we can learn from them. So, okay, improved cash or using cash for, to improve assistance, improved data to figure out what's going on. But as we saw, it's not always easy to change people's habits, right? And that brings us to what I think is the third and most important of the solution sets, which is accountability, all right? What we're held to account for affects absolutely everything. How we organize, how we define success, how we reward good practice. And what we need is a shift in incentives and a bit of a behavioral nudge to get us back on track and using the kind of things that we've just been talking about. So that's where you come in, all right? And this time, I don't mean you, the imagined refugee, and I don't mean you, the imagined aid worker. I mean you, really you. If you pay taxes, you are a donor. If you give to charity, you are a donor. If you have an opinion about this world that we're living in, you have an important voice. And all I'm asking is that you use it. Contact your political representative Contact the government donor agency that channels your taxes. Contact the charity that you support and ask them some very simple questions. Do they give cash assistance? If not, why not? Do they know if their customers, their clients, their beneficiaries are happy with what they do? How do they know that? Could they publish that information publicly? 
right? One of the benefits of the world that we live in now is pretty much anyone, anywhere can find out anything if it's in the public domain, right? Help us get the right stuff out into the public domain and ask us the right questions. So working together, I think you can help us to remember the original human impulse that got us involved in this work in the first place. I think you can help us to restore some dignity, some control, and some power to people who have lost so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>